We will be denying entry to Canada Many more to people who are not the US Republic. President Donald Trump announced the temporary to be suspension of the to beyond that so day. It was inevitable to continue the lockdown for other people. extra resources our NHS needs to cope with coronavirus, it will get. We will be denying entry to Canada Many more to people who are not the entire US Republic. President Donald Trump announced the temporary to be suspension of his measure to continue. It was inevitable to continue the lockdown for other extra resources, resources our NHS needs to cope with coronavirus, it will get. We will be denying entry to Canada Many more to people who are not the the entire Republic. U.S. President Donald Trump announced the temporary to be suspension of his measure to continue the lockdown. It was inevitable to continue the lockdown for other people. extra resources our NHS needs to cope with coronavirus, it will get.
good as well. Um, uh, so, uh, so do you, have, do you want me to use the background or to not use the background? Uh, no, uh, I think this is fine. With the <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, and we already have our first speaker also logged in, and uh, we have our director, Dr. Mamta Piraj, also here online. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. And yeah, Mr. Bijoy Ramchandra is moderator for session, and when he is online right now, we'll begin uh, in our next time. Hi, Gonzalo. Hi. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Well, a good good afternoon for you. Hi, Bijoy. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hi, afternoon. nice to see you. Good Hi. Uh, good afternoon uh, to the speakers also. I think they have logged in, right, Shilpa? Yes. Yes, ma'am, they're with us. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. So your prayers to Lord Ganesha worked, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, as you can see, yes. <laughs> All right. So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Shilpa Shirish and I welcome you all on behalf of BMS College of Architecture to the day two of Envisage 2020, an annual intercollegiate architectural fest. The theme for this year is Metanoia, change is constant. Owing to the pandemic in the current situation, we are going virtual on an online platform. In this session today, we will have the keynote address by well-acclaimed architects from Urbanista, Germany, Mr. Marcus Ewald and Ms. Sophie Noem. Followed by this, we have Mr. Gonzalo Martin Spinero, UHA London. These talks will be followed by a moderation session by Mr. Vijay Ramachandra. <laughs> also, this being a live event, I request all participants to drop in their questions in the chat box to be asked later in the moderation session. Now, uh, may I request our director, Dr. Mamta P. Raj, to introduce and welcome the keynote speakers for today's session. Uh, well, good afternoon. And uh, on behalf of BMS Education Trust and uh, BMS College of Architecture, I extend a very warm welcome to the speakers, moderator, and uh, faculty members, dear students, academicians from other colleges, 
and uh, invitees. A very warm welcome to all of you to day two of Envisage. So to begin with, um, uh, we have with us a keynote uh, speaker, uh, Marcus Evolved. And uh, to begin with, uh, a very warm uh, welcome to BMS College of Architecture. And also I made a small attempt to welcome you in Germany. Hearts, hearts, way come in to BMS College of Architecture. Well, uh, Marcus Evolved is an urban planner with several years of professional experience at the interface of urban development and communication design. In 2006, he completed his de degree in urban planning at the Technical University Hamburg Harburg as graduate engineer. He is a registered member of the Hamburg's Chamber of Architects. Since 2007, Marcus Evol has been working as core team member of Urbanista and is a founding partner of the Citizens Lab Nextemberg. During many years of practice, he has participated in projects in various contexts of urban development and has held various positions. In recent years, he has been active for Urbanista as project leader or leader of content. He has supervised collaborative urban developments in Germany and abroad, including Next Bangalore in India and Next Swiss in Switzerland. Marcus Evolved work focuses on urban planning, spatial analysis, spatial design and conceptual design, as well as on the conception of participation processes of urban planning and development. He works on different city scales from area focused development, district and neighborhood development, integrated city development plan, regional spatial context to national context. His range of activities also includes GIS supported spatial analysis, cartography, urban design, and the production of spatial diagrams and representations. Further, Marcus Evolved was a lecturer at Hafen City University, Hamburg from 2013 to 2016 and is a speaker at professional conferences and workshops in Germany and abroad. His work is characterized by a concrete spatial statement and an optimistic visual expression. With his work, he aims to link current and future development trends with the specific characteristics of a location. We also have uh, with uh, Mr. Marcus Evolved, his uh, 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 office uh, partner, Sophie Noya. A very warm welcome to you too, to BMS College of Architecture and to the Envisage Fest platform. Sophie Noya has several years of professional experience as an urbanist assistant professor and city consultant in Hamburg and Latin America. She completed her doctoral studies in 2016 at Lufana University and Bawas University. Her dissertation thesis, Everyday Practice Between Regulation and the Informal Housing Market, deals with the Villa 31, an informal settlement in the center of Buenos Aires. She has a master and bachelor degree in urban planning and city development from TUHH and Hafen City University in Hamburg, Germany. Currently, she works for the planning office Urbanista in Hamburg and coordinates for different projects in the field of communication and participatory urban development. She taught as an assistant professor at the Faculty of Architecture at Piloto University, Colombia in Bogoto. 
Abogata. I'm as a lecturer at the Institute of Urban and Cultural Area Research of Lufana University, Germany. Her research focuses mainly on urban informality, social transformation and upgrading programs in Latin America with particular attention to participation processes. She received several scholarships for her research projects and has been participating as a speaker at various conferences. Once again, a very warm welcome to both of you. Thank you, ma'am. May I now request our uh, keynote speakers uh, to share their presentation with us? Mm -hmm. Yes. Very, thank you very much for the warm welcoming words. And we're just trying to get everything set up here. So let, let us hope yeah. that everything works. So before so. we start our presentation, it's really an honor for us to be here to take part of this conference. And yeah, we hope we can do a small presentation contribution to this contribution to this event so let me see that just one second could you say if, if our presentation is to be seen yes it's it's there we can see it very clearly it's okay. full screen yes it's full screen yes all perfect. right, perfect. So very, very, uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, introduction to our to our work and our, to our persons. Um, I'm here with Sophie Naue, and we are here today to talk to you about what we as urban planner do uh, in, in part of our work of Urbanista and also uh, with our projects that we do in India and in Germany. And we want to start actually with the title of it. So our, our core focus of our work is the integrative approach to our project that we try with solutions for the future and also the co-creative part of our work that we try to involve as many stakeholders as possible, the users, the people. So it's the integrative and co-creative approach we want to talk about today. And uh, we are from Hamburg, Germany. Our office is based here, um, but we also had the chance to work in Bangalore for some years and uh, in Kochi. Um, and, and there we want to actually show you some of the work we've done in the fields of urban planning and urban design. So, but we want to start, or I want to start with the, a little overview of the state of the city we're in today. And this is for us the, uh, yeah, the, the core task to begin with. So how, how do we see our cities today and what kind of fields of work do we see in it today and, and what kind of challenges we have to face? So in Europe, in Germany, uh, there was after the war, uh, the Second World War, in, that ended in 45, there was a need of building houses, of redeveloping the cities, and it was done in a pretty fast, um, very short, fast time. So one built up many houses, many development projects, but what one did in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s is that one started to separating functions. Uh, one had built houses at the edge of the city. One built um, shopping structures that are away from houses. One built houses that are away from working spaces. So all this separating of, of our cities led to uh, uh, complications we have to work with today. So when we came to India, we um, actually, we were thinking that in India, the, the, or I was thinking that personally, that the, the urban core, the, this uh, working together of functions and livability is one of the, the strengths of the Indian city. But with visiting the new development projects that happened all around the, the cities, this is something in Bangalore, uh, we found out that, yeah, kind of the same tendencies seem to happen, that one will uh, separate the functions and, and, and we have to be aware 
that with this separation of functions of places where we work, where we shop, where we live, where we spend our leisure time, that leads to uh, creating these day cities where people spend their time at daytime and night cities. And, and this has all kinds of uh, disadvantages being from um, economic opportunities for people living there, for uh, chances that you encounter with other people uh, and, and you also lead to causing a lot of mobility needs that that uh, that will uh, you need when you separating these these functions of the city and this is something from Bangalore from Bangalore I think this is Richmond Road when if I if I remember right so you, you're causing these mobility needs because the cities aren't compact anymore they aren't that you and your in your neighborhood can can do the things you do in your you need to do in your daily life you have to travel a lot in within the city and yeah you all, you're always on a constant rush uh, instead of having things around in the city so what happens in the last 10 to 20 years if you look at germany but also maybe in india we had the the upcoming of new technical possibilities so the internet really had a big impact of, on our work. So since 10 to 15 years, people could not only consume information through the internet, but they they could start to be content creators. They could start bringing up their own content. They could interact to interact with other people online. They can um, yeah bring up their own content and and uh, bring things up and and this together with some kind of failure of planning and, and I would describe it in, in Germany with the separating of functions, we, we lead to a city structure that from the building side is kind of fine. They, the, the infrastructure is good generally, but but it doesn't work. It doesn't work how it's supposed to be. And there are situations happening like gentrification where people are forced out because the economic situation is not really working for some people. And on the other end, you have India where there are a lot of overlapping planning tests, tasks. You have to deal with mobility, but also with housing and uh, to see how this can really be tackled as, as planner and architects. And in Germany, it led to that with the maybe it has also has to do something with the power of the internet, the power that that people are now um, able to to bring up their own voice, their own idea. That people demanded to be more involved in urban planning. That it doesn't only have to be done by professionals, but only by themselves as well. And 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 we've seen that in the last ten years in Germany happening all over again. That people go out on the streets and demanding to be included in planning. And this is something from the vision planning in, in Bangalore. So uh, this is also something that we experience in India, that people demanding to be to be part of a planning process. And this has, I think, our has to define our work now, how we can do this. So what are the consequences for planning processes and urban design? Uh, we have on the one hand the dysfunctions of the modern city that what I described is uh, the separation of functions and all the, the what comes with it. But also we have these new technical possibilities for people to interact and also interact between professionals and, uh, and, and, and the citizens. Um, we also content wise have to think of that we not only um, if, if we if we plan something, if we build something, we only not only tackling a design challenge, but we also uh, have an economic ch challenge behind it. So in the future, we have the, the fourth industrial revolution coming up. So the internet will have a big impact, digitalization, how people will work. And we have to be aware of that the gap between the poor and the rich gets gets wider and wider and and new development has to somehow bring also up economic opportunities for people. We have um, to deal with the new social paradigm because life plans change. The, the classical family structure might not exist 
in, in that same anymore. And we also have migration and globalization. Uh, you have that in India, we have that in, in Europe as well, that people coming up in maybe higher um, numbers and, and have to uh, find a home. And we also have the ecolo eco ecologic challenge that we have the climate change, but also we have local environmental issues. And this also has to be part of our planning. So on the one hand, we have these new ways of multi-stakeholder participation that, that we have to integrate more people and they demand it. And it also makes the planning better. I, we can show you some examples later. And we also have to think of this integrated thinking and planning because only with that we believe we can really address these challenges challenges if we take up all the the, the aspects that, that have to be included in a planning project. So our understanding as a plan and architect might change since we came from the position that we were the know-it-alls, the, the plan that had developed the master plan. And with this master plan, everything will be answered. Uh, we don't believe that this that's the case anymore today. We become more uh, like advocates for ideas like communicators and and uh, someone who will foster uh, a discussion of a development and bring up different opinions and different ideas together into a very comprehensive planning. Um, we want to show you some two projects uh, of Next Hamburg and Next Bengaluru. These were our kind of city labs we started. We as Urbanista worked as a kind of classical planning office. But in 2009, we thought it would be time um, because, yeah, the social media was rising. There was this tension of people wanted to be more involved into urban planning, that there would be a time that we should think of this urban planning in, in a new way. And uh, we thought it would be a good idea to have this city lab that is kind of open, that we don't want to have an agenda set in the beginning we want just people to have the chance to express their views of the future of the city and together with us professionals develop ideas how to improve it. It's simple as that. It was not um, that we had a very strict agenda. It was more this impulse that we want this hands-on, we want to this do-it-yourself mentality and that design thinking um, logic that we want to test things out. We want to just explore and by doing and not just only by doing research and, and uh, statistics. Um, this failing participation in Germany was the starting point where we were not convinced that it's really working anymore because with a lot of projects where this participation part was mandatory, it wasn't done in a proper way, we believed. It was done because it was legally enforced to do, but you had sometimes the feeling that this is not really, really uh, loved by by the, the professionals who are doing this. And and a new planning approach should be open enough that people can kind of, yeah, make it their own and also um, bring up their, their color to it. And um, so the concept of this citizens lab was that we started by collecting ideas by by just get what's in people's head that then in the second part we bring it together with professionals because we have to be be, be yeah, aware of it some of the ideas that the people come up with they are not uh, feasible of doing but there's usually there's some very good point in it that you can take and bring together and then, and this is still the outlook, then they can become really projects out of it. Let's wait a second. Just to drink a little. <laughs> so our principles of um, Next Hamburg, I just uh, explained a little. We wanted to make it as, um, yeah, as ex accessible as possible. So uh, one, one, uh, um, phase of our project, we we rebuilt this abandoned um, shop within the city of Hamburg in the shopping area and we made 
out of, out of it, we made a shop for urban development. So we brought up all the ideas that were collected over the internet and showcased them like products. So people can just have a look at them, comment them, and also put them into their basket and like shop the future. What would people do if they had the power to um, develop the city? And this gave, gave us some extensive knowledge of what people would actually do and, and what is very necessary to be done in the city. What are the necessary planning tasks and what other planning tasks that might not be that uh, necessary. And we also experience not only online, but we also uh, try to make workshops a little more event-like. So usually in, in Germany, the planning, um, participative, participative planning uh, workshops were kind of held in, in dark school classes, classrooms in, in, in a not so pleasant atmosphere. And we just wanted to make it event-like and media supported and yeah, so that everybody has a good time while working on, on a project of the city. We wanted to use kind of material that is playful and, and people don't are hesitating to interacting with. Um, um, but we really use the internet a lot. Like with this next Hamburg, the core um, concept was, or the core center point was the website where a lot of impulses were given by people. And um, so we had this on the one hand, this online part where we built up a community through Twitter, Facebook, the website, the newsletter, but also had these events that, um, that we, uh, with both of these spheres, we, we were able to interact with a lot of people because some people are more online because they didn't have the time to go to workshops, but others don't like to use the internet. So with the combination of both, we felt we, we ended up reaching a lot of people. And the interesting thing was with all the ideas, I think we collected over 4,000, some of the ideas for the future of Hamburg. We were able to cluster them because um, although there were a lot of single ideas, they a lot of them could be clumped together because they had the core area or the, the same topic or the same meaning. So with this book we did of Next Hamburg, we were able to just combine these single ideas into a story of the future. So together, these single ideas could bring up a perspective for development and we clustered them into places where we felt there's a possibility of change and and we as professionals and this was our duty at that task we took the ideas from the people and we just developed them further so this was the outcome of it in all terms we did uh, like spatial visions we also did some structural visions this is new uh, imagined plan um, public transport, um, but also some kind of uh, visionary, visionary ideas of uh, housing, of rooftop usage, of how might informality in a kind of dystopia could also infect us as a city. And we also had the children inter included in our workshops. We had special interest workshops with children and, and they had a kind of uh, the ideas that, that were not so common with the adults, but also quite interesting, like the, the pony uh, fast lane for, for getting from A to B or, or walkable houses that are flexible to wherever you are, the houses come with you. Um, so this is, this is something we learned that the children might have also some, some good ideas to brought into the planning process. In, when we started in Bengaluru, it was in 2013, since um, our next Hamburg was, um, uh, we, we had the attention of, uh, of some uh, professionals from Bangalore and in Berlin from the Mott Institute, and they were asking us if we could do something like this in Bangalore. It was, it was done in a very small um, not, not with a with large budget, but with a, just a, a 
tech um, yeah with the approach of just also just doing it was not that we had a, a three-year plan so we started um, with all these situation that we found uh, with the with the website and the website had this possibility that people could just put things up they could address they could address uh, topics they felt that that have to be brought up uh, but also we used the time to explore um, and we actually went to the people themselves because a lot of people don't come to planning workshops and and they they feel that they are not professional enough to um, to 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 join these but we also had the our approach was to to come to them to directly ask them what what would they want to for their future to be in the city what what should be improved we had also classes um, students from architectural and planning universities coming and we used this storytelling as a format like these old Indian comics that we found that uh, we used to communicate our process but like studying the urban life how the situation in India is was was really important for, for our work to start and in the end of the first phase that was done in 2013 that we come up with a very first initial change map we called it so we call it, we put all the stuff we collected up on a foldable map that was um, something like you had in the old days you can fold up and on the one hand you had marked the areas that people were put up for redevelopment and on the other side you had some background text of what we did in the second phase we in 2015 we had the Bosch, Bosch Foundation that gave us uh, some money to um, to continue the work with Next Bengaluru and we decided that the whole city is like especially Bangalore is, is such a huge city that um, that we wanted to focus on on one side of the town and that was uh, Shanti Naga the neighborhood so we we came up with uh, the the Shantinaga neighborhood to work with and our idea that time was that we wanted to build up a place a space within the community within the neighborhood that could be the meeting the melting pot of um, of people coming together and discussing urban planning so um, for us it was pretty clear that we need this physical space although Online is important. Online really, really helps our work. This physical space where we come together, this cannot be um, cannot be done online. So we had this kind of abandoned lot within Shantinaga that we um, used as a temporary outdoor office, uh, and, and we brought we built everything um, our, on ourselves just uh, some some exhibition material and um, yeah and and wanted to have this space that is welcoming for everybody to just explore and come in and interact with each other about the future of the city and this this was here for about half a year when we worked in there and we collected a lot of ideas we discussed a lot of ideas and we also had some cultural uh, events there, just very important to, to also have formats that will people, um, yeah, attract people to come to, to events. And, uh, and once you have the people there, then you can also talk about uh, the future of the city. There are also some exhibitions of um, uh, sit like topics that are important to the city as well like this photo exhibition was who builds the city and 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 the people who actually build the city are sometimes forgotten the construction workers so so we also had this in mind and and had exhibitions and discussions about that um, we also had some playful interactions because some topics are really very hard to to have a, a comprehensive insight and and that was 
for us and also for other people, the situation of, of the garbage disposal. So we had the friends uh, of Fields of View. I'm, I'm not sure if anybody is, is uh, attending from them at this event. They are really good in this game making um, and, and uh, game interaction. And they built up this, this game where, where people could actually, uh, through, through this playful approach, they could, um, they could learn about how multidimensional this, this whole thing of, of uh, garbage disposal is and why it's not that easy finding easy solutions to it. Uh, yes, we collected a lot. Uh, we had a lot of special formats of uh, working. This was with children of also in a playful way that they explored and, and also explained us how they interact in their neighborhood. What is what is the places they like? What kind of places they are missing? Where they live and, and how they are using the city? Um, like in the first phase, although we made this welcoming place, we could not expect that all people will really come to us. Some some hesitate to to enter this kind of space. So we also went out in the neighborhood, and we had these drawing and mapping exercises where we through these events interacted with the neighborhood and uh, we collected all kinds of information because there were not really uh, good maps available. So we really had to start also in mapping and bringing them up on open street map. So in 2014, there were not so many things mapped uh, in 2016, there were a lot more. So we brought some of our collections up on the internet. So to make this map, more comprehensive as a, as a base for urban planning and development. And we also put billboards up within the whole neighborhood just for people to interact with it. And we were really surprised how good this worked. We thought they might be all get stolen the, the, the day after, but in the end, people were really using them and not, not only for fun, but really for, for honest and, and, and good ideas and yeah, wishes for the future. And it was really, it was really kind of heartbreaking to just collect them and, and, and do something with it. And what we've done with it was the people's uh, vision on future Shantinaga, we called it. So we collected and, and um, did a yes, survey with all the uh, material we gained and, and we brought it up to a map as well, the Shantinaga change map but also with kind with experts to some kind of initial projects that we could envision for the site. And this was up in this little booklet that's also available online. So you could have a look what we've done there and, and uh, what we uh, explored, yes, what kind of possibilities the... we explored for, for future development of the site. And although we didn't get anything built, just to come up with some questions you probably have yet, uh, I think we raised some awareness that that crowdsourcing for for the future is is a good idea and and it really could work that something like the next Bangalore might have shown that people can really come up with good ideas together with experts and I think this is our core core point here that we don't think that people can really do it alone they need still the help of professionals but the professionals also need to listen carefully what is important to do. And with that, I just hand over to Sophie, who will uh, say some things about the work we've done afterwards, like the last two years, in support of GIZ, the German Development Corporation in Fuji. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Marcus. I think um, you all got some very good first impressions on how we work and how we take like this participation and the approach from the citizens serious so and mochi meaning my kochi in local malayam so maybe you know it much better and we did it together um from urbanista and gsz side and the main idea of this project was to encourage the participation of as many different people as possible like to really have a lot of different people from different wards, from um, Fort Korchi, from the islands, from the um, city center, to really think together, 
creatively and freely about the future of Scorchy. So that was the idea to really bring um, this future topic, how a city should or could develop into an urban lab. So um, a little bit in this approach from Bangalore uh, is to combine crowdsourcing and co-creative working methods and to showcase like really future visioning um, involving the citizens, local experts, and finding together some, some perspectives for the urban future of Kochi. That was the main idea. So um, this project was part, or who was part of this project? Um, we had the GIZ, the German Corporation, Urbanista and Erbs. Um, Erbs is a collective from Mumbai. They work in Harawi and they do a lot of um, community engagement, different projects with the community. And so um, that was a really, really good um, combination of how to work together with our knowledge brought from Germany and as well um, combining it with um, the work methods from Erbs. <clears throat> So what we wanted to do was really to discuss how our cities could be like. So trying things out in a living lab. So um, having really the possibility to discuss the future of a city together and to encourage future thinking and formulate really desirable future. So that was our idea in, in this project. And we involved a lot of different um, people and um, stakeholders. So there's always this question, who should be or who should take part? So you have this difficult Indian planning structure with a state level, with a municipality level, with a ward level, and you have people. So for us, it's really important to bring them all together in an urban lab. So having the people from the different wards, having as well stakeholders, um, local professional um, external experts to discuss together to really um, bring all of these different approaches together. So this was um, the idea in this um, 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 lab. I think Markus already mentioned it a little bit. Um, how is our our philosophy to work? Um, our idea is always, or in these projects, is to think outside the box to really really make people think freely. And like, like there are no limits, so we can, can take every input serious, so there are no wrong ideas. And um, we allow to make mistakes, so we can try things out. And this is um, this combination of creating between technical knowledge and the wisdom of the crowd. So co-create um, creation methods and as well having these technical experts view and to bring these together. I think this is a little bit our philosophy and it's quite important to understand that, that in this process. So we had um, we had some milestones in our process. So we, we started this project in January 2019. We spent one month in India and we built up one exhibition together with Herbs and um, the support of GIZ. And in this exhibition, we had this we had some some moments where we had the exhibitioning opening but as well we had this exhibition running for 3 months um to be a place um open for everyone everyone to visit and to bring in their ideas really to have this open studio where people could join people could work and people were invited due to some workshops so I think that this is an important point and we had some workshops on site. I will show you some, some images and we had a design sprint. So we had this framework of like, like three to four months being in India or having our colleagues from Herbs and GIZ being in this exhibition and us being on some, some different points. So our approach was um, as you can see on the left side was this space where we built up the exhibition, um, some online formats and a workshop series. So it was a really combination of a base camp, public planning office, open to everyone um, to provide a digital solution open 24-7. So you could um, join a survey 
and really inform yourself about and to coach you and give your opinions and to have this workshop series, to have this outreach in the different wards of Kochi to really get to where the people are. For all of this, we had as well some thematic approaches. So um, we wanted to address the main um, challenges of Kochi. So we had um, we focus on some global challenges and we try to break them down in a in a in a, in a local way. So as you can see here in yellow, the identity of Kochi was one of our challenges. How to maintain and um, respect cultural identity, I think really important if you if you focus on a city as Kochi is with this um, strong aspect of heritage. So we had the challenge, the coastal climate change, preparing Kochi and its people for floods and um, weather conditions. So as well, really, really, an aspect related to Kochi. We had some topics, neighborhoods and houses providing qu um, quality and safe housing in, in a vibrant environment. This is more a general topic, could fit to another city as well, but it's really important in Kochi as well. We wanted to address the um, public and common ground and environment, address mobility factors. So how are we going to move in the city in the future? and how could be like or how a transport system could be like accessible and as well like really thinking about new future systems one really important um, challenge we wanted to address is local um, economy and labor spaces so always you have to think about how these future structures for sustainable income should look like we had some really basics um, so basic services and welfare so thinking about services um, which are accessible for all. So these were our seven um, challenges. And with these challenges, we built up an exhibition addressing these topics to the, to the citizens. So here you can see, um, this is how we build up this exhibition in the folklore theater in Kochi and um, inviting different people to really talk about and to think about um, these components of the city and to think how to, to interact in an integrated way, thinking about the future of, of Kochi. So this was the opening of the exhibition. And um, yeah, the main idea was, as in Bangalore, really to force discuss, discussions, to make it as well um, really simple for people to give their opinion, to give to their ideas, to so make it simple and accessible, but as well to, to address some topics that people can think and reflect on it. So really take your time to really think about new things. And I think one thing that's always really important for us is like to playful interact. So we created a huge model of Kochi so this is um, Kochi, you can see on the right side, Erna Kulam and then the islands. And um, to, to create this huge model where people could um, see where they live. So we had some, some, some Leuchtturm. Lighthouse project. Lighthouse projects, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, where you can really, really find um, where you are and you could, um, could put on some ideas addressing maybe next to your neighborhood. So we had this model that works really well and was really nice to interact with people. And we created these different urban options. These urban options are related to the challenges and are to address like different, different topics. And so you could place these urban options on the model and really get like this playful um, format to interact with people. So, um, yeah, we um, did a documentation of everything. I think this is um, just one of the last moments. Everything <laughs> is a little bit not organized anymore, but yeah. And as I said before, we had this web app online tool. So we did a survey um, related to our seven challenges to the Kochi identity, to basic services. So um, this survey was um, online for more than three months, I think, and it was accessible in English and Malayam. So um, 
we got some approach from people who couldn't join in the exhibition. So having an exhibition three months running, it's really nice and having some workshops there and having workshops on site, but it's not accessible for everybody. So we have the, had this online and we had um, a lot of different workshops with special interest groups. Um, during the three months our project was running, we had a, all ages, gender professionals joining our process. So this was one, one workshop with the students, with different students from Kochi. We also had workshops with artists and children. So I'm um, really thinking about how they would like to have Kochi in the future. So as you can see in the background, you can see our panels and there were a lot of stickers already posted on. So that was really an interactive um, <clears throat> exhibition and working space. We had a um, workshop with um, specially abled people conducted by GI Sad and the in the in the um, folklore theater. And yeah, as I said before, we had this um, outreach, um, really doing consultation workshops in the different neighborhoods. Here you can see the different wards we went through, or mainly our team from Herbs from Mumbai went through with some colleagues from Kochi. So we had like um, um, three locations on the main side, the Market, market Canal, Anakulam, and um, three locations on the, on the islands, Fort Kochi, Matancheri, and Entakochi. So where we went through, so the, the main idea there was like really to go to where the people are. Um, not everybody can join us in, in, in our site, so go to where the people are and, in, um, and understand their needs related always to the challenges we addressed and to really explore together like opportunities for the future development of the city. Yeah, this is another workshop we conducted together with Herbs. And we did like all these documentary and um, display of the ideas from the workshops. And um, yeah, we went to the different neighborhoods as well, like to, to, to discuss our main challenges site specific. So we discussed housing in one neighborhood, the subjects of waste, mobility, water, heritage, so these economy activities. And yeah, and then we had a different format. Um, what was really, really interesting, that was a design sprint. It was after the three months of our exhibition running. And in this format, we had the idea to really um, bring first ideas or bring all these, we, we collected so much, bring all these information into first designs. So to make them understandable, to really bring an idea from a written format into a picture, into a design, um, and to bring these citizens knowledge, expert knowledge together. And we had one week where we worked again at the folklore theater. Here you can see our schedule. We had every day a different topic. And we had every day an expert talk, but we had as well, like all the people invited to come and to really design together with us and um, some other experts from Germany and India. So that was the idea of having a design sprint, having really one week of um, really comprehensive working and to bring some ideas into, into designs. So um, we had all our collections of the exhibition, all, all the ideas we collect due to the web, due to stakeholder workshops, the um, Typhoon. And then that was the idea to do first ideas and perspectives like a little bit more visible. So doing this whole design sprint, we discussed a lot of different topics, challenges, and we searched a little bit for a red line to get like um, a guide how to bring these different approaches and different ideas into one measure or into one, 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 one for a bigger picture, I think. So um, we defined water as a defining element of Kochi, and we thought that water is a really, really important aspect in Kochi. 
And when we thought we could think about water as working space, water for transporting goods, water for public transport, um, but as well water for as social infrastructure. So social infrastructure means as well water as um, recreation and public space, thinking about water as an heritage, um, water for food production, recreation, and I think really important water as identity of Kochi, something unique in Kochi that should be um, dealt with in the future. So that was the idea to have this um, defining element to bring all our ideas a little bit together. And yeah. And as you can see on this map, almost um, a huge part of the surface of Kochi is covered by water. So it's really something unique to the city. And it's really something um, the city has to deal with in the future. So we came up with a lot of different ideas in the different neighborhoods um, related to water, related to the canals, and as well, like taking really serious um, the challenges. So taking really serious um, the, 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 the flooding in Kochi, that's a problem from the backwaters, but as well from the ocean. So um, we developed the first idea of an active breakwater in the design sprint we did as well um, first or we developed first ideas of a monsoon street and neighborhoods for the neighborhoods. So the idea was how a street should look like um, to not always get flood during monsoon. We thought about how to how to really um, think or reuse these old water tanks you have all over Kochi, how you can integrate these structures again in the in the into the city. Um, there were some approaches really thinking about this informal housing structure, how to reuse material, but to rebuild and growing houses. And we thought about how to, how to address um, or how a school should look like in the future, how could be a learning community created and all of these different topics. So, um, at the end, we had an exhibition in town hall. So all our ideas, approaches from the citizens really got um, displayed in town hall of in the town hall of Kochi. So there was a symposium with different talks and um, this exhibition. So people could really see that we brought all their ideas from the neighborhoods into town hall. What was really important in this moment or really important um, for projects. And yes, um, this was not the end, end of the project. And we are really happy now to show you that um, we had the possibility to go on with this project because um, we brought it into, or this year we brought it into a design competition. So the idea was to really launch a national level urban design competition in India. We did it together with, or we are doing it together with GIZ, with Herbs Design Combine and Urbanista and the Kochi municipality. So here we had the uh, possibility to really this competition this year in June, I think, and we already have some winning teams. And the idea was really or we worked on a on a design brief and we thought about which topics should be addressed in in Kochi to foster integrated and participatory urban, de urban development and we selected the Mulashari canal in Anakolam as one of our our or as as our site for this design brief um, we had defined some tasks so there was always the thematic of the canal, but as well of the surrounding housing areas, um, MG Road to integrate mobility aspects. So we did this design brief and um, for this neighborhood or for, for this, sorry, for this area. And um, the idea was to have different groups of um, with professional backgrounds like architects, sociologists, um, really to think about an integrated approach for this area. Mm. 
We planned a lot of outreach as well with herbs. It was a little bit more difficult in this project because of the COVID situation, but we had some outreach in the neighborhoods. And um, yeah, but some of our activities couldn't happen, but we had some community involvement and we asked as well on our website to um, the residents of Kochi to share their thoughts, stories and experience next to the neighborhood. <clears throat> and then we had a jury session in September and we defined um, three winning teams. So we have three different approaches. I think we got 120 entries from all over India and we selected three winners. So one of these winners, or oh, this is the, the winner, it's a concept adapt, connect and empower really sensible approach how to deal with this area how to how to interact with the people and um, you can see that they had developed a toolkit and we have a second um, approach waving with water some kind of similarities with this toolkit um, really thinking about some small intervention really sensible interventions in this area and a third um, prize for holding water where they had a different subside they addressed um, the bus stand. So if you are interested in that, all these um, entries are displayed in the homepage of Antikochi um, design competition. And um, yeah, um, our work will continue with this project because we are, we are conducting these process of a common vision of the master plan. So all these three teams get um, and contracted and will develop some DPRs to really implement projects in the future and to think about a common vision for this area around the canal. So with this, I would hand over to Marcus, who will yeah, look at the time, uh, a, little at the time a little bit. And, um, I, if, if somebody can comment from the off how, how many more minutes we have, then I, otherwise I'll just continue. Um, just no, we can go on for some more time, so that's all. Okay. Right. All okay. right. Perfect. Thank you. So our learnings from these these projects in in Hamburg, the next Hamburg, but also from the project in India, where we like explored the ways of um, co-creating of of developing new methods to work with um, with people together. We also incorporated in our regular work of, of uh, what we do in, in Germany as a planning office. Since next Hamburg and next Bangalore where these kind of spin-offs, these labs where we just develop things, we have this regular day-to-day -day business where we just work for contracted studies, guidelines, uh, development concepts and like regular urban planning jobs and and these in these projects we also brought up these interactive methods of working together with people and this was for a city development plan like an, a city master plan for the city of Braunschweig uh, and we uh, yeah we also got to the people we got into the neighborhoods on a public space where people had didn't have any fear or hesitation of, of joining us that when you do it in a room, there's always the wall and the door as a barrier. Uh, in Bremen, we found a playful uh, concept where two people can just like in a game situation could say what's important to them. And what, what really uh, drives us is also this aspect that we want to have uh, impulses like uh, test things out so so we give different options and see what would people like more and this is a simple interaction they can just put a bean into a, a glass and, and the more beans it gets the, the, the clearer it gets the, the vote um, we also try to use playful methods uh, like Lego to, to work on how could a city might look like uh, or clay or these kind of uh, volume uh, sliders where you can say, okay, in, in this neighborhood, really, this is missing. We should put the volume like of this 
this uh, usage. We should really put it up. We, we, we need more of this here. Um, and also use the internet, like the new ways we have today, like a, a street mix. This is an open source program that everyone can use and you can uh, play for, say, we need more bike lanes, we need more uh, wider footpath, everything. And you can just simulate it because you can really do your actually street there. And it's very simple, even for non-professionals, just to come up with something. Uh, we use the internet a lot. Um, also with this new smartphone coming up in Switzerland, we had this very easy interaction of a mobile phone, like this app where you can, um, uh, yeah, very, very simple, just give feedback on, on urban situation. And also in the scenario game uh, we developed, uh, to be in the in the power of a mayor and and say if, if you had the power what would you do? Um, I think this is also common. I know it from some some friends from from Chennai who who do it. Uh, the city walks. This is a, we found out is a very good tool. You you walk together with people from the neighborhood and you discuss about things. You learn a lot from them while you walk around and. Uh, and this this would really help. You can also use this little. Uh, we also use this little um, express shuttle if the if the area is too large to walk or too dangerous. This was an old harbor site, so we couldn't walk there. Uh, we also wanted to get people more involved in the decision making. So we had um, in another project the possibility that people were actually be able to vote on what kind of project they would really like. So they had a budget, the city had this budget for a uh, park development and they really wanted to people to say, okay, if, if they had the power, what, where would they spend the money for? And, and this we organized as well. So a little bit back, and I tried to, try to make it short in like about five minutes to the theoretical part of it, these integrated planning and, and and I found at the Biennale in Venice once a quite interesting exhibition where they just showcased about the, the mix of functions, the income and the ages and the humanity of the city and how important it is to bring it all together in to creating a vibrant city and, and uh, the city that is good for everyone. And I think this should be the overall goal for all urban planners and, and, and architects to, to develop this. And if you want to bring it down, this is actually quite, was a quite interesting study from the ETH Zurich. And they um, had a study on urban qualities. So what makes a place really a nice place? And, and this is kind of the accessibility. People can access the places. They can adapt it, the adaptability, so they can just, if uh, one usage doesn't work for, for one house or for one, for one room, they can reconfigure it. Then you have the diversity of people, of different ages, incomes, whatever, uh, but also the diversity of usages and functions in a city. You have the um, appropriation, you can just really uh, like a like a space uh, like a city space you can yeah you can make it your own you can you can uh yeah use it and of course you have a little centrality so a little density doesn't hurt for creating this liveliness um that is really important and and then we have also the, the fact of the city of short distances that we as planners found that that are really important for a good neighborhood, a good city, that you can reach uh, the most important things by foot or by, by bicycle. So you don't have to travel that that far. So you have kindergarten, basic health care, supply, schools, neighborhood parks. You have it all in a way that you can reach. You don't need a car for that. Um, and then you have access as well to, to public transport that will help you get to other cities. So um, having this in a lot of cities, especially in Europe, that separated functions, we want to come more in this situation where we have this mixing functions again in the neighborhoods. I think this is a important task of us as planners and architects. Uh, and yeah, and if and, and also important is the 
the transport from one quarter to another. So the public space is important that is between the uh, functions between the buildings that we have to be really aware of. This is there where people meet, that they can adapt, that they can interact with other people. And also the, the vertical mix within a building. This is very difficult if, if we want to uh, implement it because there are so many economic situations that there are uh, in terms of law, in terms of that developers are only focused on either um, office or, or apartment buildings um, and to bring it up, it it's, might sound easy. In, in the end, it's, it's quite a challenging task. And just some examples of integrated thinking from, from Germany. This is my hometown um, where they also mixed up things. They had this dike that is to protect the city from 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 flooding but it's at the same time it is the most exciting park you can think of because if you sit there you don't see that on the on the right side there's like the open sea so it's like uh, it's a cinema for free you can just watch out see the sunset uh, uh, yeah do a sun bath um, and um, but in the end it's it, it could be a very ugly infrastructure thing but it's become a park um, with the new building projects um, in Switzerland, they are also really focusing on on the, the ground floor to, to make it as an interactive place. And since the economy is really in a, in a change, we you see a lot of the internet nowadays. You have online shopping and, and it is not, not, not like the old days anymore. Um, you have to find new ways like cultural usages to bring up in these ground floors to just for people to have an interaction and not to have this singular singularization of people that everybody is only thinking of themselves and not of anything else. And this is also a really, really good project in Copenhagen. Uh, it's a super Keenan park and they involved really the citizens uh, for developing what do they really want in the neighborhood. And also because this is the most diverse, cultural diverse, uh, neighborhood because of a lot of migrants living there. They all brought up elements from their origin countries. So they, they could really make this place a showcase for diversity. So if you go through it, you see, I think, elements from 50 different countries. And this makes this space so special. Or same city, Copenhagen, um, when you try to bring up a, a energy, a waste to energy plant, um, with a building that is usable as a ski slope or as a hiking slope. So you can really become creative, although it's, of course, it's not easy. And learning from Bangalore, I found this very exciting. If, if you really ask people and develop, um, develop solutions with them, they really had this integrated thinking more than, than, than experts, because they know that what they need is, um, often combined and and for them um, that, that the neighborhood is really working needs to address these integrated themes and topics and just and with this I will close our um, talk um, just an example uh, of our work when we are allowed to develop really solutions for the future for for new uh, building projects this is uh, on the city border of Frankfurt and we were asked to develop a concept um, how to really, yeah, develop new neighborhoods at the at the border of the city where where the city ends, and and we called it Micropolis, and and the idea behind is to connect landscape with the city with a kind of dance, but uh, a structure that allows you see it in the yellow spaces where people can make the spaces their own, they can adapt them, they can uh, change them, they can make temporary usages out of them. Um, but you, you really have this, this places where, where people can encounter. And uh, what was really important for us was also a diversity in the structure that we have building typologies, that we have um, floor space that really differs. So diversity is, is key here. So uh, people can have really different houses in, in background. And uh, what will come up or, or could come up with, with something like that is uh, places that 
that people really can come together that they can use and also interact with the nature and and finding maybe also new economic um, possibilities for the city of the future so this is what we would really like love and, and and like to develop further so this is I think our our end statement um, of uh, yeah working co-creative and integrated to find solutions for the city of tomorrow and with this I want to close our speech and I'm um, I think we are looking really forward to a discussion. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there will be another keynote and then we will all get into a discussion. Or Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you, Marcus and Sophie. I think uh, your presentation was extremely engaging for all of us. Um, at the same time, uh, a small reminder to the audience to drop in their questions in the chat box to be asked later in the moderation session. Now, may I again request our uh, director, Dr. Mamta P. Rajna, to introduce and welcome uh, Mr. Gonzalo Martins Pinero, our uh, second speaker for this session. Uh, thank you, Shilpa. Uh, well, uh, Gonzalo Martins Pinario, after graduating with honors with a master's in architecture, Gonzalo has had the opportunity to collaborate with a number of leading offices and architects, picking up knowledge, skills and work techniques and experiencing different approaches to architecture, while at the same time pursuing a passion for landscape architecture and urban ecology. Also has a postgraduate degree in this area. He has built his career on designing and leading to completion with on-site technical management. Projects of various types and scales in different countries, environments and climates around the world. Before joining UHA, Gonzalo was collaborating with Joe Ao, Louis Cario da Grasa um, in Lisbon. He was also design director at RSP India from 2014 to 2017, managing the design and research cell, in charge of the design team for singular projects of every scale and function all across India. From 2006 to 2014, Gansaro worked at GJP as a lead architect successfully delivering a la large range of residential, commercial, educational and retail spaces. From 1999 to 2006, he was working with Pedro Matos Gamayro and Carlos Crespo, becoming a partner of the firm in 2004, where he worked on a number of award-winning projects. A uh, very warm uh, welcome to you, uh, Gonzalo, and uh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mamta Piraj, for this uh, nice welcome. Uh, and thank you, BMX, for, for the invitation. It's an honor and a pleasure to be back in Bangalore, if it is just virtually. Um, I'm going to share the screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Is it, it full, is screen? full screen? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so just just one previous note uh, to Marcus and Sophie. I really loved your presentation and I'm sorry that I missed you while we were both overlapping in Bangalore. Um, the title of my talk today is is Change or When You Do When You Know Better, You Do Better. It's a quote from Maya Angelou. And uh, the idea of this was to, to show how uh, knowledge helps you on each step of the way to address the change. And it's something that we barely need uh, or that we uh, are in dire straits of needing these days. So my world map. 
this profession is about leaving a mark in the world, and and I've been lucky enough to have the opportunity to work on on uh, quite a few countries, uh, and that's um, not bad for someone who comes from a very small town that is lost in the borders between Portugal and Spain. Um, I've been lucky enough to be involved in many different types of projects. Uh, some of them got some recognition, some won some competitions. It went from office spaces to uh, uh, mortuary houses to schools to towers to uh, master plans and, and they, they've been growing in, in scale and in complexity as the years uh, have gone by. But what I wanted to really talk to you about today is my favorite uh, type of building to design, which is schools. Um, I've been lucky enough to, to be involved in quite a few number of projects in four different continents and the ones that I'm going to show you today tell you more or less a story of, of how these uh, uh, how these steps when you start growing and when you start uh, uh, learning more as a designer they inform each other three of the projects are going to be in, in Portugal and two of them are going to be in India uh, the first one is the faculty of pharmacy and it's a very special one for me because it was the, the very first competition I was ever involved in. The, the, the firm was very small at the time. It was just two partners and, and myself. We were uh, as shocked and surprised as anybody else when we actually won the competition. And the, the project and its construction was my real education in architecture in many, many respects. The site was a, a blank page at the time. Uh, it was one of, this was one of the first buildings to be built in the new health sciences campus for the University of Coimbra. And uh, uh, the building that we're talking about is this one. And it was, um, as per the competition brief, we had a, a very specific volume that we needed to uh, assess. We won the competition mostly because we managed to squeeze one more floor um, while still keeping the total area and the maximum height of the building. And what that allowed us was to, to free up a, a much larger um, central courtyard and a lot of area in the ground level to create um, a public space, a new public space that was uh, uh, lacking in the, um, in the master plan. Um, furthermore, we wanted to, to the building to represent a little bit of what far, sorry, pharmacy actually is. It's a, it's a, a highly technological and advanced science, which is based on, on a lot of precision uh, and a lot of numbers, as, as we, uh, over the last few months, uh, have all uh, been faced with. Uh, but at its core, it's using the power of plants and herbs and natural elements to improve our well-being. So that's what we decided that the building should be. It should be. It should look like a, a, a machine, very technological. It should be a huge metallic black box that was probably displaying its technological nature um, with a lot of moving mechanical parts that allowed it to open and close the, the volume. But then at its center, it, it would have to reveal a much, much softer interior, um, one that would have to be a lot more inviting and would allow you to understand the passage of time. This, this huge atrium that at the ground level would be uh, either entirely open to the street um, or, or, or transparent, allowing you to see everything inside, making it very public. Um, these are some of the conceptual models that we made to illustrate it. Uh, it's, it you can see the, the, the black solid body contrasting with the ever-changing, ever-beating uh, heart of the building. And the result was pretty much what we envisioned. And it was our first experience in working, uh, working with uh, um, building skins. And you'll, you'll, you'll hear me talking a lot about building skins uh, as we go forward with the, with the presentation. Um, you might ask yourself, or you're ask, you might ask me, um, isn't a, a black building uh, counterintuitive in a country that has so much sun because it gets so hot? 
Um, and the answer is yes and no. We use that to our advantage because um, the, the facade is entirely ventilated behind it. It's, it's made of corrugated aluminum sheets and it does get hot. But um, the, the air chamber behind it is such that um, um, you have at least 20 centimeters, in some cases up to a meter, up to the insulation level, the insulation layer of the outer skin, so to speak. And the air behind it gets hot enough that it creates a chimney effect, it creates a, a um, convection effect, and the heated air goes upwards along the facade inside, creating actually a, 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 an air pillow. And uh, the secret for this is if you have uh, the, the intake at the bottom and you have some way of the air to actually um, come out on the other side of the top, uh, the airflow will, will actually keep the building cooler. So by making it hotter, we made the interior cooler. Um, this corrugated aluminum sheet skin uh, has perforation in, in some areas, and mostly in all of the windows, and the rest of it is, is not perforated at all. But in some cases, you cannot really tell even where the, in, where the windows are because um, the windows are mechanically operated. This was a challenge, um, especially at the time, because it, it was a very artisanal system. Uh, think of each of the windows as, as a, a garage door, if you will. And uh, we had originally uh, prescribed it as, as being gas-operated pistons, but then um, for budgetary reasons during construction, it was changed for, for electric alarms. We must have approved um, four or five different versions of this. And it was a huge um, risk option because if, if you imagine that 99% that, uh, of them worked fine, at the number of windows that we were talking about, it, it meant that at least four of them would not be able to open um, even at the beginning because we're talking about 400 uh, different motors. Um, luckily, we, we never really had any complaints about it. The system is still working fine to this day. Um, so that turned out well. And we kept the color palette to, to the minimum, even uh, in the interiors. Um, we just played with black, white, and some different textures and materials, except for, for uh, some very specific areas. And this was important because um, this being a pharmacy building, it has lots of labs and lots of technical areas that we needed to be uh, maintained and uh, we, we kept all of the technical areas in, in black, um, just with small, almost imperceptible color indicators to identify the type of pipe that we were looking at. Um, this is one of the main uh, lecture halls we used at the end. I'm not sure if you can perceive it, but it's, it's a mirror on the other side of the light well that uh, um, multiplies the, the um, amount of light available and minimizes the effect of, of you understanding that this is actually an underground space. Um, we created these, these uh, public areas for the students with just changing and adding a, a slightly yellow tinted gray uh, to, to get a very subtle hint of warmth in some of the areas. And the, the, the way to treat the lighting was also a recurring theme throughout the building in different locations with different relationships uh, uh, of these bench, these bespoke benches that we designed. This is what one of the labs looked like before being uh, entirely fitted. Um, and you can see the transparency that you get uh, from the inside um, even though the building looks very opaque and, and very dense from the outside. We, we wanted to make sure that the view to the outside was always uh, guaranteed. It, it basically provides a good balance between the sun shading and, and the view that was necessary for the well-being of the people. And this is the effect of the courtyard. Um, it's, it's covered with uh, climbers that change color across the season, seasons. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, the university decided early on to not let the plants grow uh, beyond one single season 
So the wall is never really fully covered. It, it always goes down uh, in, in winter, but the effect is still um, quite impressive as, as the climbers grow significantly over, over the course of one year. Um, we chose a plan with, with, with um, Leonor Scheich, who was the, the landscape uh, uh, designer for this, uh, with us, and we chose a plant that could not stick um, to metal and glass, so the, the windows are never, ever obstructed. And, and uh, the, the climbers really grow up to two levels, um, and with a simple yet uh, ingenious <laughs> irrigation and drainage system inbuilt in the, the, on the design of the windows, it's basically a hydroponic system that that uh, allows for the this effect to happen, and you can see here the the difference between the ground level and the upper levels. But uh, um, it it gives it a, a little bit of a, an effect of, of hanging gardens, and um, to us the, the the buildings only matter when they are actually lived in. And the, the courtyard works pretty well as that, that um, big entrance hall that we were proposing. Um, we uh, had envisioned at the start to have this small cafe with some outside seating, um, but uh, the university decided to turn that, that space into a, a bank branch. So uh, the... the Students still occupy the first two levels because it's the undergraduate levels. Uh, they occupy it um, very extensively and they, they found uh, novel ways to, to actually um, colonize it. Um, but it's, it's on the upper levels that then um, the most focused research um, happens. It still keeps the same palette uh, of, of colors. We had to design most of these um, lab benches. Some of them are in ceramic, some of them are in glass, some of them are in stone, some of them are in plastic, depending on the actual um, materials and, and functions that uh, were needed at the time um, or for each of the different labs. And um, yeah, it, it was, it was um, Easy to make this building work well as a functioning community, but it, that that was easier also because it, it has a very specific um, population and context to design. Um, so what happens when you need to design for a, a much broader population and, and you have to go not only for, for adults, but also for all sorts of ages? And that's the challenge for this uh, school. It's, it's, it's the Pedro Hoop School. It's situated on the, the northernmost point of Lisbon. Uh, it was a very fast paced project. It, it really gave me um, uh, some, some insight of, of, of the, the speed that I needed to, to work on later on in India. Um, and it houses roughly 1,200 students in about 17,000 square meters of, of built up area. Um, the location is was an old abandoned factory site at the northernmost tip of Lisbon, and it's it sits by the river right next to an old landfill and uh, the Vasco de Gama bridge. The school was going to be dedicated to Pedro Hoop, who was a, Jew, a Jesuit uh, a missionary that um, believed that the world should be unified and the different people had more things that should unite them than the things that should divide them. He was a very firm believer on the... Uh, on everybody fulfilling their full potential. And he traveled extensively around the world with that message. So we used this as a leitmotif to create a very grounded building, a very horizontal building in line with the landscape. And uh, this would have to represent the very large masses of land united by something much more porous, more water-like. The design had to be flexible enough to allow for the different services and each of the buildings to be used completely independently. Um, but the language needed to be cohesive, regardless of the programs inside of them. It's basically eight buildings that um, work, um, if you look at them counterclockwise, it has the admin building, the canteen, the, the nursery, and then you have basic school, secondary school, and then you have the gym and the pool buildings. Um, 
we needed to make sure that that uh, the original factory setting was also taken into account and the landfill was used to our advantage. Um, so we used one of the main landfill uh, areas as the, the main landscape area of the building to minimize the the uh, not only the construction but also the uh, excavation. We actually found during the, the the during construction that there was a full basement of the building of the old building that we ended up using as as uh, uh, the music classes. So this is what the building uh, looks like, and we wanted, um, in order to manifest the concept, um, and after several uh, different versions of different tries, we settled on two main materials, well, that would be cork and glass, and the ground level would be cladded with grass brick, uh, um, glass bricks uh, representing the sea, with all the circulation and common areas being washed in light with some sort of ripple effect that would resemble water. And the upper levels would be cladded in, in, in thick panels of cork, uh, which would represent the earth, the large masses of, of both protective and, and inviting material. Um, it's that living, breathing skin that I was talking about. Um, that That's what the cork gives you. It, it also changes according to the seasons. And, and the result is somewhat uh, reminiscent of a certain Japanese austerity that uh, we believe that Pedro Rupu would would appreciate. Uh, the strategy is the same for all the buildings, so regardless of what they house, all of them become um, the same in, in people's perception. These, for example, are the gym and the pool buildings. And um, the glass walls became um, more of an opportunity and not so much of a constriction. Um, we could use them as, as privacy screens, as you can see here, that, that create nooks and crannies for people to use in the, the public space. Or we could hide other types of spaces altogether. Um, like if you see this cross here, it actually is the, the light that we used for the chapel inside. Um, the materials are all very, very um, honest. They're used very raw. Um, and the, the landscape was designed by Georges Homme uh, at Jardim de Passe. And we tried to let the natural colors speak for themselves and, and be uh, the, the highlight of the uh, external areas. Um, very rarely we do give it a little bit more of a design flair, like in this dome right at the entrance of the external lobby, making the, the, the pause moment of, of the circulation before we went to either the admin or the, the main um, buildings. And the building ended up winning a few national and uh, international awards for uh, architecture, sustainability, landscape, and even for graphic design for, for its brand identity. Um, I remember once asking uh, some of the kids who go to the school if they liked it, and one of them was actually trying to convince me that the whole building was made out of chocolate and that's why it was such a magical school. And, and, and I can only imagine what, what a positive effect something like this has on a child growing up and, and going to school like that every day. And the school has been consistently rated one of the top 10 in the country, which is, is quite a feat for uh, a school that is so recent. It's not even 10 years old. Um, but again, it's... It's about the other challenges. It's how you go from um, a school that has a great site by the river uh, and, and it's a, a private school with some money to spend on, on finishes to um, designing not a private but a public school in a much harsher environment. Um, this was a, a, a secondary school, a, a little smaller than the, the previous one, for roughly the same amount of students, but it, it's, it's only for the ages of 11 to 18. It was, again, a, a fast-paced project, but it had the advantage of not having to go for approvals because the, the state was actually the client. Um, because Parque Escolar was a, a major government program in the early 2000s in Portugal for renovating most of the secondary schools. The, a lot of them were quite derelict. This was one of the cases. We were selected as one of the architectural teams to design one of them. And uh, luckily, it was in, in Alentejo, my home region. 
uh, just a stone's throw away from my hometown. It's about 60 kilometers. Um, Alentejo is, is particularly known for only having two seasons, which is uh, winter or hell. Imagine an African savanna, but with cold, rainy winters. So I knew what I needed to do to, to protect these, these uh, kids from, from the, the elements. And finally, the name of the school, Hernani Cidad, uh, came from a famous writer and teacher in the early 20th century who, who hailed from Rodon, who is the, the, the town where this school is, is located, and, and that's to whom they dedicated the school. So the rules were simple. Uh, uh, we had to keep as much of the original school as possible. We needed to accommodate a large target number of students with very specific technical brief. We could use only half of the site because the rest of it was already earmarked for, uh, and, and for use for the primary school and the sports center. And the, 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 the half of the site that we had had a very steep slope that we had to negotiate. And we had a, a much more limited budget because we're talking about public money. So what we decided to do was to simplify um, the circulation of the, the existing school and the, the typology of the existing school with its, its uh, uh, small courtyards and replicate it and create a building that in terms of volume would complement it, but also help um, negotiate all the problems that the site itself had. We had basically connecting two uh, uh, almost parallel buildings and we created this um, central circulation that is, um, it entails a, a concept that was um, very dear to Parque Escolar, which is the learning street. So things happen on each side of, of the, this main circulation as you move along. You have access to both the admin areas and the, the library and the music area and then the, the canteen. And, and it allows you to, to have a very clear progression from what's public to what's private in the school. Uh, the upper level is is shaped off like a, a an odd donut, and it's entirely composed of of classrooms uh, occupying most of the site. What we did with this strategy was create um, this overlap between the two layers of the buildings, um, to with the purpose of creating shaded areas on the lower level. The fact that the site was so slow meant that we needed to have um, um, these kind of strategies. And the containment walls that we needed to do for the lower level um, allowed us to convince the, the, the client that it was actually um, very cheap to, to build a semi-basement and, and increase a little bit of the area. And the programs that we convinced them also to, to, to occupy there were dedicated to teaching local music, arts and crafts. And, and this was unique in all the public schools of the country because uh, these are trademark, trademark um, characteristics of the city of Rodondo. Um, and uh, the, um, the Board of Education, the, the Regional Board of Education was, was very helpful in this. And uh, it, it still works to this day almost as a separate part of the school. Um, as far as the homage to the uh, founder uh, or, or to the people, to the person to whom the school was dedicated, um, we honored the memory of Hernan Cidad by engraving some of his quotes in the large window panes that are um, that we planted. We plan to to integrate the the shaded areas. This would give them a, a distinctive look and feel, and and hopefully make some of the students curious about their meaning and the history of these quotes. These are some of the models at the larger scale uh, uh, where you can see the shaded areas. And the, the skin for this building was basically a mix of the previous two that, uh, that we were talking about. Uh, we couldn't use the same convection trick that you used for the heat because the building was too short. Uh, so it's still an, an aluminum uh, corrugated sheet, but the outer skin is completely perforated and it's all white, making it lighter and more reflective. 
and the inner insulating skin is made out of cork and, and it's only visible in, in very rare instances um, from inside some of the classrooms. Uh, you can see here the large shaded areas resulting from the offset of, of both levels. Um, the result is like a building layer on top of, of a separate building layer. And we used a simple trick to make the windows sleeker. We can mechanize them, but uh, we also wanted to, to not compromise the view and the natural lighting. So the, the windows are actually much larger from the inside than what they look like from the outside. The upper half of the window is, is, is covered with the skin and, and used as sun shading. Um, and then we have this theme of semi-illusions prevalent uh, uh, across the design. We have uh, we kind of uh, rounded the edges and the corners of, of the main courtyard and the courtyard being um, a, a trapeze makes it look deeper on one end than on the other. And then we have different light fixtures and windows uh, in the main hall that, that break uh, the, the, the perception of what is vertical, what is, what is horizontal. The same thing in the upper circulations, the, the, the circles that you see on the ceiling are actually skylights. So all, everything that you see there um, is natural light. And then nowhere is that more evident than in the main gate at the entrance where we uh, try to create the illusion that the building is, is just slightly floating above the outside wall uh, with everything touching very, very delicately on, on each of the other elements. And the curve itself invites the visitors in. Um, the soffit being the same material uh, of perforated aluminium also allowed us to, to hide all of the infrastructure behind it, including the light fixtures. The entire ceiling becomes illuminated at night um, and it becomes a much cleaner space. And the, the large covered areas um, really cool down all the lower portions of the building, which was the, the main intent. Now, these are some of the videos that we're taking from a YouTube series created by the students of the school. Um, I've, I've muted them because they're in Portuguese and you wouldn't understand, or I, I imagine that most of you wouldn't understand it. But um, what I wanted to point out to you is that you can see how the school has not only been keeping its integrity over the last five years, but how the landscape has grown to complement the, the white walls with just a welcoming dash of green. Um, and I, I would probably need to, to give a shout out to the landscape architect, Nun Mota, who did a wonderful job of selecting the plants that would keep this aspect um, in spite of the super harsh conditions that I, I described before. Um, you can tell by the, the, the type of vegetation that is very adapt to the climate. And it's something that, that uh, was sorely needed uh, when we were designing it and when we, we looked at it. But sometimes you don't have that luxury of, of, of getting these many green spaces. Um, and so what happens when the building occupies so much space that there's nothing left for the site to breathe? Um, that was the challenge that we faced on this next school, which is the first one that I'm going to show you from India. Um, it was one of the last projects that I was involved at, at um, RSP as head of the design and research cell. It's a very small plot that is part of a much larger development called Olympia Opaline in Chennai. Um, and the Velamal group wanted a reference CBSC school for uh, all age groups, from kindergarten to, to HSC, the 12th grade. Um, and uh, the story, as, as so many other projects in India, was mostly about the numbers at first. And <laughs> we were a little taken aback from the original brief um, because they wanted a school like the ones that I was, to, I, I was used to working on uh, with all the facilities and all the amenities, but for 50% more students uh, in a third of the area of the building and a quarter of the area of the site. So as a reference, that bring the density that I was used to, to working with as a minimum of 124 square feet per, per built-up area of student down to 28 square feet. Um, and we told them that the minimum that we should go for is about 60 square feet of built-up area per student, which is an American standard. 
And then we showed them that that American standard was uh, taken from a, a census done on the prison conditions that were considered inhumane in 1984. Um, to that credit, the, the, the client not only got the message, they, they reduced substantially the number of students, they also earmarked a, a different portion of the site to, to get all of the amenities that we needed. So these buildings were to be only for the classrooms. That being said, it still left us with a very dense and compact school building. Um, and we could not, per regulation, go, go taller than three stories. And we... As designers, we were adamant to, to, that we wanted to provide the students with a nice educational experience. So, so we needed the, the students to have areas that they could uh, explore and claim as their own um, during the breaks. Uh, so we came up with this concept of, of stacked gardens. We wanted to ensure that there would be a, a piece of greenery at every level and that you would progress in school by moving upwards and outwards and it would give you a certain sense of achievement. Um, the color palette needed to be in line with the image of the Velamal group, so we chose this, this very deep range of blues, uh, and each level would have a, a slightly darker shade of blue as, as you go up because of the difference in, in terms of light. And you can see here that uh, each level would have its own uh, mini garden and in the, the connective uh, passages. The columns would be designed uh, for two different purposes. Um, so from below, they, they become this sculptural element that allows you to sustain the large slabs. And they were very important because we, were, uh, we didn't want the slabs to have um, any beams. Um, but also from above, the, the columns were designed like that so that they could harbor a, um, a large planter that would hold at the very least a single large tree. So you have trees planted on every level of the building. Um, as for the skin, we had an, uh, an issue with all the tricks that I had before because the elements are quite harsh in, in Chennai. Uh, these images are taken from the, the, um, one of the windows of an apartment in this very development, and it was of the Varda uh, cyclone just a few years away a few years ago when when uh, um, it happened while we were designing the school so we needed to have something robust and what we decided was to go solid we wanted something that would still be um, very diaphanous but it, it had to be concrete it had to be heavy it had to be robust and still porous it's almost like a jolly but uh, but um, much um, denser. We started developing it from an early stage um, because uh, um, maintenance was a, a major issue. Another another thing that we were aware from India was that the maintenance uh, also entailed keeping the birds away. Half of the discussions were about the birds, so we designed this this jolly. Um, in with with the slope and the sizing that would uh, prohibit any but the very uh, uh, the, the very small birds to actually perch. All the ones that actually destruct the buildings, uh, um, destroy the buildings would would be uh, kept away. Uh, we did a couple of, of tests and a couple of, of uh, prototypes, and this is this is Mr. Arun Santani, who was probably posing with one of the samples that he left us. Um, and uh, the the vision for the school was this, and and we had to be very careful with the budget because, as you might imagine, it was it was much lower than we were used to. So we had to be very clever. On, on how to justify every of our options. The structure becomes the terraces, the balustrades need to be uh, safe first, but then we could design it in such a way that, that um, they could uh, soften all the edges and create the, the, the experience that we wanted for the, the school and for the school kids. And we had also the vision of using the roof as um, one of the main public spaces for the school. And um, I was quite pleased with the development of the project. Um, 
when I had to leave India to move back to, to Portugal at the time for, for some personal reasons. Um, and these were the last pictures I got at the time. Um, progress seemed to be very fast. And they actually managed to finish the school in time. But unfortunately, it, it never really got to completion um, the way that we envisioned it. And the first and most important victim of the value engineering was the, the as, as it so often happens in these cases, was the, was the, the skin. Um, the building looks a little more plain, a little more unprotected from the weather and, and, and a little more dwarfed in comparison with the residential towers around it, which was one of the, the, the key problems that we had was this, this difference between the scale of the buildings around it and the, the building of the school. So it needed this sort of armor to protect it. Uh, but they did execute the, the columns uh, like the way that we designed them. Uh, with the, the the trees that are growing on top of them, and uh, all in all, it's it's a, it's a nice environment. But I, I have to admit that that the the detail that is missing, it's uh, I would have to take some of the blame for it for for uh, not being able to take the project to completion. Um, but again, the feedback that we've gotten from uh, the the project is overwhelmingly positive as well. Uh, and, and in India, that, that is saying something. And again, it's it's the, the it becomes more about the people who live in it and make it their own, not so much about the, the building that could have been in our heads. Um, that being said, um, I'll show you a building that is still in our heads and that I still have high hopes for it, what it can be. Uh, so, um, this is is in Pune in, for a new developer and a, a new development in, in a prime location in Kordagam Park, which is near the, the Mulamutha River. Uh, and as you can see from the context here, how how extraordinarily green Pune still remains, even though it's it's one of the, the, the major tier cities in, in India. Um, the site is is quite long. And uh, it, it's going to be divided in three parts, one for a commercial building, one for an amenity, and one for the school itself. I will have to talk to you ab about the whole before going back to the school, um, because that, that's what the entire development is and some of the challenges that it has. We, uh, the, the developer wanted uh, an iconic building and for that, they, they at first they asked us to, to design a tower. And what we managed to convince them is that uh, it would be um, just as iconic if we use it as a groundscape instead of a, a, a skyscraper. Um, because there would be a lot of advantages even in terms of, of how the uh, regulations would treat the building if we kept it under 70 meters. Now, one of the main concerns that we had was how green the site was and what we were doing to it by um, basically blasting it with, with these buildings um, when we inserted them. So we came up with this idea of keeping the green continuum um, by uh, allowing the mass of the podium of the lower buildings to still be um, greened out and to use it as public space and be able to be not only be green, but also be used and usable uh, by um, the public, be it at, at the, the, the office building or at the school. The result is something like this, in which we hover the entire um, office building on top of the podium. Uh, that is a lot more massive and it, it harbors some... some um, retail areas, some, some F&B areas, and uh, creates a new public space that you can actually see from the, the mirrored um, soffit uh, down from the street. And it frees up the building to be a little bit more um, of a, uh, an aspirational building for the, the, um, the office. Uh, it creates all sorts of opportunities for Diwali or for Independence Day to be, if, if you want to be a little bit more playful about it. But um, 
all in all, what does this mean for the school itself? Okay, so we push the school to the back uh, where it would have um, less visibility, yes, but a much better relationship with the, the river. Um, and it, it presented a little bit of a challenge in terms of circulation. But we believe that by the time that the, the school is uh, built, the, the planned circulation that goes around um, near the river will also be part of the, the infrastructure of the city in, in, in India. Uh, honestly, it's, you never know how these things would pan out, but that is the plan. In any case, the, the, the school works even if you don't have that, that circular road near the river. The, the structure of the building is very simple. You have the, the main social areas and admin areas on the, the ground floor. And then you have mostly classrooms um, uh, as you go up and you create special rooms as you go up as well to have um, for the, the, the more advanced uh, students and classes. This also always with the relationship with the green as you step the building uh, upwards. And this is a, a, the first school that we're doing with, with uh, um, a basement and it has its own uh, tricks to, to achieve that in a place like, like Pune. But it's absolutely uh, key for the, the, the good result of the school in terms of, of um, how the circulation happens the the amenity plot um is also key to to have that separation between the school and the the office building and also because it's going to be um used uh, as the school as a as a as an outside area so the volume of the school is quite small especially when you start comparing it to um the the office building that that uh, uh, towers over it. And the office building will have spaces that uh, uh, by its own sheer scale, the school cannot compete. So how do you, how do you address that? With, again, the skin and the materiality, we were uh, thinking of, of using a, a type of ground construction that is, is simultaneously massive and diaphanous again, using a uh, straight of, of local basalt stone that is uh, taken from the river. So letting the office building um, breathe on its own and become its own icon, this is this is a view from the Yaga Khan bridge. Um, you let the school be a part of the environment along with the podium for the building and therefore creating this sort of, of, of new environment and public space that uh, both complements and is part of the um, landscape and not so much uh, a building, but uh, uh, a community area. Now, the, the building, we don't know what's going to happen. It's as simple as that. Um, with the, the, all the uncertainty that is um, around the world right now because of the pandemic and also because of the uncertainty of, of how the, the Indian market is going and uh, all the vicissitudes that we all know that architecture entails. Um, uncertainty is the right word, but we're still hopeful. And um, these uncertain times um, make you have to think also in different ways of, of working. Um, this is, is a video of, of a few days ago in our office in which you can see there were some people working and because of a COVID scare, some people had to, to stay at home. And right now there's a lockdown in, in London. So uh, as many people as, as possible should be working from home. I'm working from home right now. Uh, but you can see it's almost like having uh, this these little ghosts in the machine because people are working from home, but still um, doing uh, everything that they need to do from the office. Um, and UHA, the, the, the company that I'm part of right now and I'm a senior associate of, 
has been dealing with this for quite a while now. Um, we were quite prepared um, to, to address this because we thought about it as the UHA challenge um, from the get-go. Um, even though we are a, a small company, we're about 50 uh, designers, uh, we are spread across three different continents. Um, we have offices in, in Lisbon, in London, in Limassol, and in, in, in Mumbai, and we have representatives across the world. Right now, for example, uh, even though in this map it's only marked um, in, in Japan and in Italy, Copenhagen, and, and Mexico, we have uh, a few people working with us from Taipei and some people working with us from uh, Moscow. So it really has become a, a, a 24-hour studio. Uh, there's always someone uh, awake. There's always someone working. And uh, for that to happen, we, we are basing it on, on four different pillars, the, the talent, the technology, the innovation, and, and the, the global aspect of the, the, the company. Um, this all comes down to, um, I'm not going to bother you too much because you're, 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 I'm sure that you're aware of all the technology that is, that is uh, out there in the, the market. And we use Archicad as our weapon of choice because it relates to Rhino and Grasshopper in a, in a more uh, expedite way. And we are all working on the same models and we're working on, on with, with different servers. Um, and it comes down to, to those two central arrows of the talent and the global. Because at, at the end of the day, it's, it's, um, it's about the people. It's, um, it's for the people that we're uh, uh, building the, the, the buildings for and the, the people that we're building the buildings with. And you never know what, what to, to expect. And, and I can tell you, for example, that um, on that team, at least these two, I can identify as being ex-BMS alumni. So I, you never know when, when we're all going to be working together anyway. Um, what I can tell you is that it doesn't matter if it's in 2005 or in 2015 or in 2020, the the feeling is is the same and and this idea and this notion and this this uh, firm belief uh, that our total is better than the sum of our parts is is what will make us resilient to any change that comes our way. So not for nothing, but I'm actually looking forward to see what is uh, coming next. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gonzalo. I think that was a truly uh, intriguing uh, presentation that you've shared with us. We uh, next have a session uh, moderated by Mr. Bijoy Ramachandran. Bijoy is an architect and an urban designer based in Bangalore. He's a partner at 100 Hands and is currently the design chair at BMS College of Architecture. May I please request which, uh, Mr. Bajoy to initiate the session. Thank you, Shilpa. And uh, thanks, uh, um, uh, Gonzalo, for the uh, presentation and also uh, to Marcus and Sophie uh, for the presentation in the, in the first half. Uh, it's interesting uh, uh, the way that uh, these lectures have been curated to have the two of you uh, from Urbanista and, and Gonzalo together in, in the presentations today. Because in some sense, uh, you know, you, you guys are kind of on different ends of the spectrum, so to speak. Uh, but I thought I'd start uh, to talk about, uh, and, and Marcus, really your background as a communications designer, I was really interested to hear that. So in, in terms of just communication, uh, so my first sort of prompt to both of you would be that in, in the work that Urbanista does and both of you do as urban planners and people who are interested in the city, uh, of course, we saw some samples of that in what you presented in the morning, but communication is at the heart of it. How do you get 
more people to participate, to communicate their ideas, to and, and then to assimilate all of this in, in a way uh, that then is meaningful. And then to communicate it further to people who, who may be in, in power or who, who have the sort of uh, wherewithal to do the work. And in your case, uh, Gonzalo, this idea of communication is a lot less uh, sort of diverse. Your, your stakeholders, so to speak, are kind of uh, limited. But I think in, in your case, like you had shown in those two schools where in some sense the communication is also a bit more uh, philosophical in a way, you know, you're taking these strands from, you know, like, for instance, from the from the uh, from the school that, uh, you know, you had uh, the, the, the sort of quotations on the building, etc. There's this notion that the building is communicating some larger theme or some larger idea that's behind these schools. So maybe both of you can talk a little bit about how this idea of communication and talking and, and sort of exchanging is at the heart of the work that you do, if it is, uh, if that's true. Yeah. Marcus or Sophie, you want to go first and then Gonzalo. So I start and, and the others just just made, Gonzalo, you, you as well just break in if, if you have some some thoughts on it. I can just reflect a little bit of our view. Actually, I am I am trained as an as an engineer, as an urban urban planner. And cert shortly after after finishing school, I was kind of a little bit frustrated in doing these plans, these master plans, and all this stuff that ended up usually uh, not being implemented. And, and, and I find it quite interesting to go on the communication part of it and with this uh, try to, to gain, to mobilize people in really bringing things forward. And I found it for urban planning a really, really uh, important tool you have to or like uh, ability you have to have nowadays to, to really promote your work and also really make also not only to interact with people but also with stakeholders and, and getting people convinced and, and a buy in to your to your ideas and what usually I guess helps us sometimes in the in the thinking is that you put yourself on on, on the other side's position like uh, the the regular people or a special stakeholder, whatever, that you try to see um, what is really their language they're speaking or what is their desire and, and try to find a real question. Because what we found in Germany, a lot of these participation uh, projects are lacking a little bit that you have the engineer that really they want an answer for their question. There's kind of their specific question to be with a this participation process to be solved but people sometimes they don't really want to talk about that but they want to talk about the broader picture or, or other topics and and you have to really keep in mind that that you have to really change your view sometimes of of the other person you're communicating with to in order to make a good communication strategy and i don't know if, if so mm -hmm. we can add something it. Yeah, I would like to add something because I have this experience teaching at the university in, in Bogota. And so in Bogota, um, maybe it's quite similar to in some cases to India. So the, the role of a planner is changing and still students in Bogota had in mind that this picture of Le Corbusier conducting a plan, conducting a city vision, like, okay, this is how it looks like. So, okay. and I, I, I really like Le Corbusier, that's not the question. So, but I think the question times is- Times have changed. <laughs> times have changed and our role has changed. So for me, it was really an advantage to, to teach at university and to really bring um, my students to get into this community engagement and to really get down from, from their theoretical perspective as well, their language and to really interact with the people ask the people what they need, really make it, or develop some methods as well, how people can engage. And then I think it's still really important to have the planner because we have our planning backgrounds and we have a lot of knowledge that people on site don't have. So it's really important to bring this together, but it's more like um, to think really critical about your role as a planner and how you can communicate in this moment with citizens yeah at at uh, uh I, I you're absolutely right bj in in saying that we're at uh, opposite ends of the spectrum of, of uh, at least of the design process 
And I absolutely agree with Marcus and, and Sophie that uh, at an urban planning perspective, because of the time frame that we're talking about in terms of the projects, it's key to have that participation and that communication with all the stakeholders in advance. Mm. Um, when we're looking at the micro scale of the building, the, the, the time scale compresses so much and the, the constraints are so, so uh, different that the, the stakeholders are, are a lot less. And um, in terms of the process that you were saying, that's exactly why um, I, I make it a point to go back to the buildings mm. that we've designed previously so that the, the, um, the lessons that are learned from the communities that are occupying those buildings inform the ones that we're building uh, afterwards. Right. So it's 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 about the process of communication. It, it's become a lot easier now with with all the tools that we have on the internet. Sometimes that communication even happens without some of the stakeholders even uh, noticing the fact that there is so much information, um, right. so much content produced by the the users themselves about the spaces that they're they're in. Uh, the 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 videos that I showed you about the the school in in Redondo. Uh, they are not even aware that I took them. They're they're all available on 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 YouTube. I've, I've marked them on the on the presentation, and I was very happy because I, I had contacts with the school board afterwards, but I had never uh, spoken to those students and see them um, uh, so so happy occupying the space and, and explaining so many things about the building themselves made me very very happy. Right. Um, yeah. That. One, it's it's really uh, interesting. Also, this uh, you know the comment that I think I, th I think Sophie made this comment about the wisdom of the crowds. You know that uh, that somehow that one can uh, mobilize that the internet or you know all of the technologies that we have give us the ability to now uh, get a more democratic uh, sort of uh, voice out there, so that everybody has a way to engage with. Uh, I mean, this is the dream of the internet, right? All of us are, are thinking that this is the internet has now given us the ability to give everybody a voice. And of course, we are only seeing the collapse of that idea, you know, everywhere where there's this kind of a hijacking of what that voice is and what the opinions are and who gets to say what, etc. So I just wanted you to reflect a little bit uh, on on what it means to enable uh, technology to get these voices out. And what the challenges are in this process that you face, you know, on a on a on a day to day basis in the work that you do as participatory planners, like what are the challenges you face with technology in trying to get a sort of uh, equitable and democratic voice of what the city should be? Because that seems uh, idealistic in my mind, and I don't know if there are any challenges that you see in that process. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can reflect on it. We we are doing with Urbanista a research project about digital platforms. So platforms where people can engage. Um, and um, we we analyzed like three different types of uh, types of platforms, like crowdsourcing platforms. So where you just go into with the idea can be a first idea. Crowdfunding platforms where you really want to get your project built or and um, and to to, to collect the money um, with the crowd and platforms that are um, mostly from the official side. So, so you have a crowdsourcing process and then the city will build it. So um, we did this research project and um, we learned a lot about, yeah, in general, these tools are really um, um, good to force dem democracy and to get all the people engaged. But um, at first, people need to know about this. Mm. And so this is really important. So to get the people to know about these platforms, to get the people to know about this process and to make them understand what they can do. So this is a question of resources. So mm. it's not only about money. It's as well about um, how to okay. bring all these resources in the um, administrative way together so that you have really people who answer to the people. And um, I think that's really, really difficult. And this is really um, can just um, work if we if, if we take it really serious, if we really invest money in it so um, that people not only participate with an idea and then they never get a feedback. So it's really important. We had one case when we analyzed in in um, 
in, in Reykjavik in Iceland. So there, um, they had this crisis, finance crisis. And so just to build on trust again with the politic, they um, set up one of these platforms. And that was really important for them to give everybody feedback, not only to ideas right. they accept and they will construct, to give a feedback that people can understand when their idea is not going to happen. And I think this is really important to, to build this moment of trust from yeah. um, the local planning perspective and the engagement of people. So and the was, administration. I yeah, mean, and the administration. This is this is, I think, in in Germany is still a problem. Uh, other maybe Scandinavian countries are a little bit more forward on that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure India is lacking this as well as Germany a little behind, and and getting also the administrative structure into this new kind of methods because they are yeah. some kind of overwhelmed by what 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 are we supposed to do this doesn't fit in our work schedule something like that and yeah. uh, therefore you you have on the one side some new possibilities but on the other side you have structures that don't really incorporate this these new features um yeah. maybe just one one comment of, of our work of of up 10 to, to 15 years now with the with, uh, technical like technological methods of of urban participative urban planning. Um, what we really found useful and extremely successful is the in, in, in communication of, of planning, like to give people insights, to, to get them the information they need, to also use multimedia to, to just explain it in a way that people understand it. Therefore, it's highly useful. Then we also have this first phase of collecting and, and simple voting. This is also really working quite well, but we're still lacking a little bit of this collaborative work. I mean, up mm. until now, we really haven't found yet a way where you really work together and, and also see view and opinion of other people and just incorporate it into something new. I mean, this is really where things are now also, the development is also coming. I, I see like, if you heard of the Miro board, something like interactive whiteboard mm -hmm. to use, this is also helping in, in collaborative work. But up until now, it was really difficult. And therefore, we always had a mix in our pr processes that we, we used the internet for some parts, but also it was really important to have the the, the real world meetings and, and mm -hmm. yeah, the formality that comes with it and, and, and that you can't hide behind it nickname mm -hmm. and you have to be stand up for your for your thoughts mm -hmm. and ideas but maybe as well this is something that due to the COVID situation now is like getting much faster um mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. we 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 know that it's a pity that we cannot be in india right now with you talking mm -hmm. in in person <laughs> and in our other project in the kochi project as well so i think uh, mm -hmm. online always has to be accompanied with offline like real events but online it's a good yeah. tool and we can do a lot yeah no in fact the, the, the reason why i asked the question was also you know in the games that you've designed in and even in the questionnaires on the kochi you know and the kochi website even the way that the questions have been formatted it then uh, sort of in a way forces the person who's responding to also be more aware of their situation of their surroundings so it's it's in a way a design process that is then prompting the citizens to take more ownership of the places that they have. So I think that that that's something that kind of, you know, you, you spoke about it and you expect that it's taken for granted, but it is, you know, I really appreciate the amount of design that goes into the way the questions have been posed, the games have been designed, that then they prompt people to then become more engaged in their places. So I think that's that's a kind of design in itself, in and of itself. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm just going to ask uh, 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 Gonzalo one question and then I'll open up for questions from the students. Um, so Gonzalo, you worked in, in India and you worked, you're working now in London. Um, and of course, the obvious question to you uh, and with the two projects that you showed us, uh, the Indian projects, both of which haven't yet been, uh, or one of them has been built, but not completely. And, and I completely sympathize uh, you know, with, with the challenges that you face uh, with, with and the second one as well. So I just wanted to ask you, one is, you know, this, this uh, the, the, the amount of resources, the money, 
you know, the budgets uh, and then your ideas as an architect and your, you know, dreams that you have in your head for these projects. Do you, what, what are the differences that you see in the way that you're seeing these projects come to fruition in India in the projects that you worked here versus the ones that you do abroad? You know, what are the challenges or opportunities? Oh, that's 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 a loaded question, PJ. <laughs> Now, see, when I was uh, when I moved to India in 2014, um, I didn't really know what to expect, and I was extremely um, surprised, pleasantly surprised, about the amount of of um, talent that is that is there, and and um, finding uh, that the way that people thought and the way that people. Um, um, really designed wasn't that different in terms of process from what mm. we do uh, in in other parts of the world there is um, there is however always the the problem of scale and of numbers the sheer uh, number of, of, of people that is always involved in the, the, the scale of all the projects that that were involved uh, granted uh, my experience is a little limited because of, of the fact that I was working at RSP. So uh, all the projects are always at a, a, at a much larger, larger scale. But even in the conversations with uh, uh, all my friends and all the, the other designers that I met, uh, the incredible designers that I met in India, the, the fact that there are so many people always involved uh, was, was an issue. And I was very happy to see uh, that Marcus and Sophie are bringing a little bit different perspective because one of the, the the things that I think is missing in India is the the discussion and the openness about a uh, public space. Mm. All of your uh, uh, gardens, all of your parks are walled up. There are no actual uh, plazas and places for people to gather. And there is very little uh, ownership of the community of their streets. The fact that most of the streets are actually called roads uh, indicates that the mentality is that this is not about me living it. It's about the cars. It's about how this connects. So uh, that that difference in mindset that I'm sure that will will happen over the course of, of one generation is the key difference in in India. It's that that lack of of um, ownership of the public space. Can I get, Gonzalo, can I get Marcus and Sophie to just comment a bit about what you just said about, uh, you know, this kind of public space in cities? Do, do you have a... Yeah. Yeah, um, maybe we can comment on that. I, I think it's really interesting because I think it's um, there's a lack of public space in one hand. There's a lack of public space where people can meet, where people can come together. Um, and you have closed public spaces. I, I saw it a lot in Latin America as well, and um, due to the security um, subject, so they, they close gardens, parks and stuff. But I think it's really important as well to focus on um, what kind of um, public space we can see, because if you go into a informal neighborhood or into a neighborhood you have as well, like, like just stepping out of your door, it's already open space because maybe you have no no cars in this place or or you have the community really to interact. So you have like your living room on the street as well and where you interact with your neighbors. Right. So I think this mm -hmm. is a really, really interesting quality of um, public space without planning. Mm. So I think where mm -hmm. is it missed more in the formal way, how it is planned. So, but if you see how people use as well, if you see how people use the street in India, how they interact, how you can see, see you, you have a rickshaw, you have a small shop where you can buy something, you get a dosa over there. And so you get really, really. Um, things are happening on the street. Th things are happening on the street and, think, and the street is part of a public space. I think that's really interesting. And that's something a lot more difficult here in Germany. So people are more like, okay, this is mine, this is yours. Mm -hmm. So it's more respected. I think mm. this is an important aspect, but I think, yeah, open space and public space as well, where you feel um, safe and where you have this idea of um, gender inclusive public space. I think mm -hmm. that's really important for the future. And as we saw it in Kochi, it was like our idea as well, like having the water, having all these um, water and canals. So 
it was really important to think about this is public space but it's not used it's not so used. how can we it use it potential. but it right. has a potential and how can we make it part yeah. of the city i think yeah I mean, the, 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 not, the, over romanticized like these informal structures because they of course have they come out of, of, of some necessity that sometimes is economic economic possibilities that, that things have to be shared. But uh, compare it to the new uh, development of houses and apartment blocks and, and quarters in, on the outskirts of the Indian cities, uh, we've had this actually created non-livelihood while the, the, the other places they had like people in public, they had interaction and and this is actually why it is so so important if, if you want to prevent a society from drifting in towards all individuals and, and no common right. understanding anymore of what is uh, yeah, a co common thing then without the public space it's not possible and uh, again hmm. this happened here in, in Europe as well I mean before uh, like the, the 20s 30s there was these these highly occupied public spaces and streets and and then it led up all into privacy and, mm. and to private uh picket fences and and uh, walls and, and everything mm. yeah this oh. this this informality of the occupation of the the public space is a very typical characteristic of of, of india yeah. but there's also a, a this dichotomy of there's people everywhere and they all seem to be afraid of how much people there is going to be in this particular space. Mm. Uh, and I always felt that that this, the way that the cities are being um, developed these days, are um, developer driven. So right. everything is it's it's its own island connected by roads. Mm -hmm. And that that oh, that oh. what I'm saying is that that the the public space that exists right now is the one that you're that you're describing, which is the one that that happens naturally by the people occupying nooks and crannies and and inventive ways, the 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 jugad way of of, of mm -hmm. occupying the the public space. Mm -hmm. um, and what's lacking is a little bit of more faith on how people will occupy a large planned uh, mm -hmm. uh, extents. Right. Yeah, we totally agree. <laughs> yeah, in fact, uh, you know, I, I, I had a mischievous question to ask, but I'm going to skip that. So I'll, I'll just go, <laughs> you know, yeah. anyway, so the question actually for Marcus and Sophie was also uh, to do with, you know, your work with Maud Institute and Next Bangalore uh, with Naresh and, you know, his group. And, and of course, you know, I had seen the exhibition and, and also seen a lot of the questionnaires online and participated. The question for you was that, of course, there was a lot of feedback from people, all kinds of ideas, etc. Where do you go with this information next? You know, what's the next step so that this stuff gets heard or gets seen, gets implemented? I mean, how I know with Endekochi, you've had a lot more success with that conversation about moving ahead from an idea, sort of, uh, you know, crowdsourcing ideas. So just a question about Bangalore, being that you're talking about Bangalore, how do we get these things out there implemented, you know, done in reality. There were so many nice things that came out of that. Yeah, uh, that, that's a good question. I mean, and, and it's also not, not an easy question to answer because we started this this next Bangalore as an, an impulse, something that is not embedded into a, a formal structure. But so this was kind of an initiative that is, like I said in the beginning, it doesn't have a three year or four year plan of of, uh, it was just we believed in in uh, in the things that if you start something then uh, something will come out of it and it happened uh, with the initial starting of it that that it got a lot of good feedback uh, when we just very basically started the first phase of collecting uh, so people really wanted to move it forward and. And then we ended up with a second phase where we could work a little more closely to one neighborhood and be more concrete in terms of uh, uh, of, of uh, potential visioning and, and outcome. So I think we, we got a little development um, in, in the process itself. But of course, what would be the next step would be an implementation of, of what's there been. But I, I would say the road up until this point has also been quite long from from this very thought, we should really try to do something together with people. Uh, 
And I, I sadly kind of have to say that this uh, is not really only in our hands anymore. I mean, we, we started this import and we were really, we would have been really happy if uh, some, some local, we tried to get in contact with the ward and, and try to bring up these ideas. And it just, what happens sometimes that I have no idea if that was the case, but in, in other projects where we tried to do these impulses that we've been seen as a competitor for, for the planning oh. authority. It's like right. that, okay, what, what are they doing? This is our duty to do this. And, and, and I don't know if this happened, this is something I could might imagine that have happened. So instead of really uh, taking it over, what would have been our wish, uh, they, they may have seen it as a compa competitive. And, and this actually made us in the later projects after Bangalore a little bit more careful on integrating stakeholders first in the process and not just saying, bring something up and afterwards just uh, try to connect to them and see if they if, if they want to um, continue it over. I mean, this is a, was a learning from it. Still, I'd say um, it's still up. You never know. I mean, we thought like Bangalore was quiet for two, three years. Uh, and then GIZ found kind of this project and, and thought, let's do something like in that manner, but with a, with a more clear outcome since we want to go into competitions and then into implementations. So, um, yeah, my wish for Bangalore would still be that we, we can continue it um, um, for one day or anytime soon. But uh, also, I mean, I think the road we made up until the point that we could bring up a vision for a neighborhood was also an, an, an important thing in, in terms of maybe inspiring other processes to do so in India or uh, somewhere else. Yeah, I, I would like to add something. I haven't been part of the um, next Bangalore project, but uh, of the Kochi project. And I think uh, next Bangalore project was the door open opener for the Kochi process. So, and maybe the Kochi process can be a door opener as well again for the Bangalore process. So, because in Kochi, um, the project is really difficult because we get a contract uh, mm. for a total amount of time uh, we are contracted together with herbs together with design combine and it's really getting into an urban lab going through a design competition and then having a contract with the teams um, to really try to develop dprs yeah. and, yeah. and make it implementable and we are um we just talked about kochi because kochi was a project that's really um going on right now but we are developing right now as well the design brief for Quambator, so in terminal yeah. and we hope to do or we did uh, um not the whole first phase but we did um together with taru from from delhi we did um a workshop in march in Quambator, so and um, then this process was a little bit stopped due to the COVID situation. Do, right. um, but we will go on with this process and hope to join um, or to 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 open our design call for for Quimbatore this year or the beginning of next year. So I hope right. then or we hope that this process, Kochi Quimbatore, maybe leads back to Bangalore or to a different city. So that's the. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, and and Marcus and Sophie, can we open out to questions so that the students have a way to to talk to both of you as well? Yeah, uh, that'd be lovely. Yeah, um, Shilpa, if if you, if you want to uh, invite students to either post their questions or to ask them directly, uh, we can have a conversation with them. So we did receive a few questions uh, because right. we have a few viewers on uh, YouTube as well. Right. But it did seem like a lot of it got answered through this uh, discussion and the uh, session oh. that we just had. Um, well, I can just maybe uh, say a few questions, but uh, let's see if uh, I'd like to pose the question to uh, the speakers here. Uh, it's directed to all of them. So uh, so in a, in a scenario, uh, in the cities where equality is almost non-existent, uh, how do you manage to hear the right people out? Uh, those especially uh, whose voices are never heard and their opinions are, you know, you uh, ignored or not considered in a more general scenario. And uh, when you did make a presentation to the authorities in these cities, uh, how was it received and uh, what was their response like? 
I think in our case, or I can reflect to the anti process, we um, tried really, really, and this was the idea to have this open space, our public planning um, office where people could get into, but this space was in, um, um, in, in, in uh, Fort Kochi. So we thought, okay, it's not that easy to get all these people involved. Um, so we had, as I showed on the map, we had different wards we went through. I think it was six wards um, with a team from Herbs. So they are really, really into this um, community engagement and really to go to where the people are. So we could not make it possible to get all the people, but we thought, okay, we really talked with a different stakeholder, with the um, people from the ward level and in which ward we should go and where we should can ask questions. So that was, I think, an outreach um, period of three months and a preparation of one or one and a half months to which ward we should go, where we can, where we have the connection with the community. Um, because there are always the ward leaders and some community leaders and try really, really in a sensitive way to get engaged with the community. Mm -hmm. This is our approach, but I think it's still really difficult to get all the people. It's still really difficult to get all the people as well online. So we tried it to do everything in English and Malayam. So um, to make it more accessible, but it's not it's not easy. I can remember from Bangalore, we we took this uh, push car, this market push car, like yeah. I've seen in what, probably if you've been to the presentation, and we really walked around with it in the streets of the neighborhood. And what I really find interesting that you somehow gained interest that you be staying with this colorful cart where you have this kind of maps and blankets on it. And and and, and soon we got there, people just uh, gathered around us and, and then we should really, we could have a, a discussion uh, and, and, and try some playful ways to, to interact with them. I think this was highly successful in the first phase. We had uh, students also who just rang at people's doors. They just directly asked them. I mean, this is only this can only be a, a very a very a sample of, of of the people you can reach. But at least this is something you can try because, uh, yeah, like like the Sophia also said, like if even if you try to make the most accessible place, like the, the place in Bangalore that is colorful, that is on the street level, that has an open door, that doesn't seem that you can have look to be safe inside or whatever, it's still people don't come because they are afraid if, that they are not mm. qualified enough to, to, to do this kind of tasks. And, and this is for us to develop the right communication strategy as well, to make it as simple, as colorful, and, and from the language, the right mm -hmm. term. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, my, my, yeah, sorry, sorry, Vijay, sorry. Just, just, just one minute. It's, it's, my experience, as you might imagine, is, is a lot different because there's, there's a lot less interaction with, with the, the communities themselves. What I would say is that, that um, there are there is a certain level of of distrust of of um, authority in India, and that creates a, a barrier and a problem. So what I would say is is from a from a designer's point of view, working in in different environments and places that are not yours, you do have to do what what Marcus was saying, which is try as best as you can to put yourself in in the other person's shoes. If you cannot reach that that community at least try to understand it and you would be surprised how much a, a, a something as simple as as, as uh, Canada Gotila will take you to actually allow those 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 barriers to be to be broken and for people to actually open up to you and see he's making an effort in in actually listening um the uh Shilpa, I'm just going to read a couple of questions because they're kind of related. Uh, so this is Sindhushri and Kazi have asked the question of public space. I think it's a, in continuation to, uh, you know, the point that uh, Gonzalo had raised. So Sindhushri says a very interesting and intriguing talk. Indeed, my question to architect now now and evolved is in your experience working in India and in the West, what are the people's perceptions and aspirations of, for the public realm? How different is it in India and in Germany? And the second sort of question that Kazi asks is that, you know, these public spaces are usually usurped by 
uh, you know, some uh, diverse user groups or stakeholders. And so how do you how do you use or how do you remove these barriers that have that have already been established to access uh, these open spaces or public spaces? And, and the same question can be sort of slightly tweaked for Gonzalo. You've done schools uh, abroad in, in Portugal and then you've done, you know, the school in Chennai. Is there anything different about the way that public open space or shared space is designed in India? Maybe it's climatological, but also culturally, do you see anything different in those shared spaces that really is where learning happens in these schools from your Portuguese schools to, you know, the Indian schools? So I don't know, one of you can go first and... Maybe Gonzalez now can, since we always been talking so much. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's always nice to hear you talk, so that, that's not a problem at all. Um, okay, so the, the main um, difference that I see in the schools is the, is the, is the way that it's, it's actually um, organized. Because there's, there's this, um, the, the way that the community itself interacts is very different. The fact that you have uh, assembly at the beginning of the day mm -hmm. was a completely alien concept to me. Even though I had I had worked with with the, in in a lot of different uh, schools and the the fact that you had the entire uh, school parading and marching at the okay. beginning of the day with the, the 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 drums even if it was just for ten minutes um, mm -hmm. made a huge difference in the way that they all interact with each other at at, at different um, ages. Mm -hmm. Other than that, the idea is to try to to because kids are kids everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, and um, the, you were absolutely right when you're saying that, the, that, that learning is happening on those uh, public spaces. Um, the thing that I've learned from all of the projects of the schools is that the school building is not done for the, for the children. The school building is actually done for the teachers because mm -hmm. those are the ones that are going to be there for the longest period of time. They're going mm -hmm. to have a lot, of, a lot of children coming in and out of the school. But right. the, the open spaces, the, the spaces in between, are the ones that you need to design for the children. And that right. is the same everywhere in the world, because children are children, thank God. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Marcus? maybe add to, to it. Um, I, I was just asking so Sophie quietly if, if it really differs so much. I mean, in the end, people want to come together. And, and, and I, I believe people in, in India and in Germany and, and everywhere have the desire to interact with each other and, and not only to be in their own privacy. So this, I think this is a quite an, an interesting um, study and always to think of private spaces, semi-public spaces and public spaces. So I think there has to be a good mix of all where you, I mean, you surely have to have your privacy as, as a, some, some place you have to go where you don't want to be around with anyone, but you also have to have this ability to connect to others easily. And, and, uh, and in terms of, yeah, the, how do you design it? I mean, what is usually really the good places that, um, and there it's, it's also interesting to look at these studies of the ETH Zurich and, and urban qualities is this adaptability and and this for people the ability to to make you reconfigure it in their own uses this plays a lot of role that they don't feel like aliens there that that's supposed to behave in a way but they can also make the places reconfigure it to their needs uh, this, this this makes i guess uh, also good quality of it and and then also i mean and and therefore the the interaction between buildings and open spaces and maybe social kind of control that that you don't ge generate spaces where there's no view from from others and people feel uh yeah the, the, people places are created that that are unsafe or something so the 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 role of of the the urban pattern the urban design and and the spaces plays an important role so that these are pleasant places in the right dimension with uh, at the right yeah, corner where maybe roads or streets meet or um, i think there there's there there has to be really put much attention on it and and sadly this is is, is not done that that much especially with like gonzalo said it uh, the the uh, urban development we see that is driven by investors and instead of uh, yeah, yeah planners and, and 
What about this question of misuse, uh, Sophie or Marcus? Do you want to address that in terms of how maybe public space is more often misused or usurped? Or is that, I mean, that's probably a, a challenge that you face in, in many locations that you work in, right? That someone has sort of taken up space that is actually public and, and appropriated it. You can see it in Germany as well, like maybe not, not like um, that people take this place, but um, the city. Cars take it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I want to say that, that um, really the cities are really car dominated and you have this new discussion as well over here in Hamburg in our neighborhood. We are right now. So like how to reduce um, cars and public space, because normally the, the streets are public space and they are all like covered with cars. And I think there we can learn a lot from from the Scandinavian perspective, when they construct like Nordhafen and Copenhagen, they have no cars parked in the streets. So they have this huge um, community garage. So which is, is still on the on the top, you have have like a playground and stuff. So you have these double use. And um, so you have stored the, the cars and then you have this open space. And I think um, quality is really, really different when you don't have not that much cars circulating, but as well, not so much cars like um, parking in front of your doors. And and this is something how public space is really dominated as well in, in, in Europe, not in the park, but in next to some squares. Yeah. Just take mm. mm. And in terms of security, I would say, I, I, I'm not sure if, if that intention of the question was, was to ask that uh, in mm. terms of security. Uh, I'd say this is what I just referred to, to before. I mean, and therefore you have to find the right spaces for public space and, and the right that it's embedded in, in, into a, a urban fabric that, that really gives some social control over it and, and, and it doesn't allow because a lot of people just look out the window and, 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 and so the people are safe to play there or something like that. Hmm. Uh, I think we've, uh, uh, it's already, I think, 420 here. Uh, if, uh, if it's okay with everyone, uh, can we close the session for moderation? Sure. Right. Can I just say a couple of things? Uh, just yes. uh, sure. many thanks, Marcus and Sophie. Uh, it was wonderful to see, of course, we are aware of both Endekochi and uh, and uh, uh, Next Anglo, but also to see your other work and, and to be again introduced to these or reintroduced to the ideas of co-creation, of, of working in large groups to imagine what the future would be. That's amazing and inspiring. And Gonzalo, of course, amazing. The schools are incredible. They're beautifully made and in, in some sense, uh, they abstract these notions of what all of us are trying to do to make buildings that are simple and and obvious in a way in their landscapes. So thanks for sharing your work. I hope you have success with the project in Pune and that we have something lovely to see the next time around. Uh, so thanks for sharing and thanks for being together uh, uh, as part of Envisage this year. So thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, thank you so, thank much, you so much for the invitation. It was a pleasure for us to really have this opportunity to talk to you. It was great to see you all again. So, uh, I think formally ending this session, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our wonderful speakers uh, for today's session. That is uh, Marcus, Ms. Sophie, Mr. Gonzalo. Uh, I would also like to thank Mr. Bijoy for moderating the session so well. Uh, we would also like to thank our sponsors for the event. Uh, so under the gold category, we have uh, page three bookshop. Under the silver category, we have Metro Books, Kitply, Mehta Book Sales, and Bookspace, and Allies. Also, a big thank you to the audience for such wonderful participation. Uh, requesting participants from the audience to join the events they have registered under. We also have a cultural event starting at 7 p.m., which will be streamed live on our YouTube channel, BMS College of Architecture. So please join us for that. Uh, finally, thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Bye. See you thank you, Shilpa. Thank you, Bijoy. Bye. 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 Bye.